Hi there, good afternoon all um, and welcome to our session, um, the ambition for real time payments. So we're going to uh, take you through a journey today um, of transformation from manual to digital payments with the ultimate goal of real time. Um, so just to uh, really set the scene and do some introductions, um, I'll let John introduce himself, but I'm Barry O'Sullivan. I'm strategic payments director at Kariba. Um, Kariba is a uh, tech SaaS um, TMS payments, working capital and risk management um, solutions company. Um, I specifically uh, work within our payments division. Uh, my background actually is 15 years within corporate foreign exchange risk management um, and global payment solutions uh, within the fintech world, so not directly in SaaS, um, helping organizations either mitigate and manage foreign exchange risk um, or manage their global payment processes. Um, and I'll hand you over to John. Thank you, uh, Barry, for that introduction. I'm John Vincent. I'm managing the pre-sales function for Kiriba uh, in uh, EMEA region. And I've been with Kiriba since uh, 2016, uh, you know, as a trusted uh, advisor. And I hope to, uh, you know, uh, get into uh, the enterprise-wide payment space and fraud detection as we go along. Over to you, Barry. Great. Thank you, John. Um, so we wanted to look at this session really from the perspective of corporate and treasury um, and take you through the journey from, from the manual way through to digital um, and then obviously the ultimate goal of real time. But um, let's just start really by looking at a typical day in the life of treasury in the old manual way. Um, and I'll take you through what may be um, a, a typical day for a treasurer. Um, so arriving at eight o'clock in the morning, you're collecting your bank statements globally um, and then obviously chasing the relevant banks who haven't uh, sent you the, um, the the statements. And at 9 a.m. then you're manually reconciling the information and updating all of your projections. You're entering balances and confirming investments and financing. Um, at 11 a.m. you're entering transactions into accounts. Um, and the afternoon then is set aside for payments, which are typically manually generated um, and validated manually. Um, and then transactions are finished. Um, 3 to 5 p.m. we've got bank term loans uh, and investments that are checked. Um, and then an hour for analysis. So most or the major part of the day um, is dedicated to manually optimizing tasks. Um, if we look at this, the, uh, the slide itself, um, we can see a, a spider's web of connectivity, really, um, whether it's, it is ERP systems that connect to banks or whether it's manual processes that you have in place. But it's, it is a, a bit of a minefield when it comes to global organizations with, with multiple um, solutions on one side, then multiple banking parties on the other. Um, some of the challenges that businesses face, especially in an old manual way, is of course manual errors, um, operational challenges um, globally, so full visibility or day-to-day or -day working in disparate um, treasury functions around the world, um, and duplicate payments as well. So I just wanted to cover off a couple of these points just to um, really put that in perspective. I, I was reading a recent study um, by Acuity uh, around failed payments, um, and they uh, came up with um, the uh, estimated $118 billion last year in fees, labor, and lost business. Um, so it really is a global issue for organizations. Um, the average corporate, um, they suggest, spends around $200,000 a year on failed payments, um, with corporates um, highlighting anything up to 5% of transactions that fail. Um, but some of their respondents were as high as 10. Um, if we look at two sides, really, domestic payments and international cross-border, um, they do have very different costs associated with errors um, or failures. Um, so I'll just highlight really an individual payment for uh, an, an international transaction that has a foreign exchange element. Um, and the cost of one failure for a single payment um, could be hundreds of dollars. Um, and it's usually broken down into three parts. So we've got transactional charges, um, FX exchange and labor costs. Uh, so if you look at the, uh, the life cycle of that payment, um, if you're processing the transaction with a foreign exchange rate, um, there are also bank fees as well. So either your bank are charging a fixed fee um, to cover all the intermediary uh, banks, or they give you an overseas delivery charge based on the country. And I've seen them as high as $100 um, for specific countries. Um, a few days later, your beneficiaries claim non-receipt, so the investigation is underway. Um, you have to raise MC103s, you have to speak with your bank, they have to trace the funds, um, and then you find out where they are and they're stuck somewhere because of poor data. So we then have to ask for a recall, which again could take several days, weeks, if not longer. 
Um, the funds then come back through the same channel they went out in. So all the intermediary fees that you covered um, don't get covered on the way back. So you'll receive less money on the way back in. Um, and then the bank will typically convert back to your source currency. And then you obviously have to repeat that process again. So this could be several weeks. And for a small transaction to a vendor, um, it could potentially be 20% of the, the, the actual transaction that you've just been paid out in costs through error. Um, and this process could take several weeks, so it has a big implica imp uh, implication sorry, on cash flow. Um, there's a reputational risk to the business um, and you could lose clients and suppliers because of it. Um, on the duplicate side, um, according to history, industry estimates, it's between about 0.1 to 0.5 percent of total payments are processed twice. Um, so a company with a transaction volume of a billion dollars could have a five million dollar a year um, exposure to risk through duplication. Um, the impact again, as you will be uh, lost revenue and cash flow, so that drain on profits will accumulate over time. Um, we've got a reputational risk, so a perceived inefficiency from your suppliers um, and surprise when it's uncovered. So it's, it's not a good one either. Um, but what happened if it was a whole payment file with multiple um, transactions of, of low value, high volume payments? Um, if you were sending them internationally, for example, and they might be to lots of consumers, um, you're going to have to go through quite a lengthy process to try and recall the, the, the funds back and they do need the beneficiaries to agree. Um, and you could then have to go through legal, uh, which the, the cost of each payment, um, the legal cost could outweigh actually chasing down each individual transaction. So you could be writing off quite a considerable amount. So what does that transition look like then from that manual world to something uh, more digital? Um, so for me, it is a, a, a hub, a payment hub. Um, and for me, it comes in three elements, which is the connectivity, the controls and then the optimization of payments. So for connectivity, you can see on the side here, we've got ERPs, all our manual processes. We've got financial transactions. How do we connect all of those? Um, and then on the right hand side, we've got all of our banks. Um, so how do we connect to that? Um, and that's via, um, in my opinion, a, a payment hub. Um, some of the challenges that an organization will face if they're looking to go and do this themselves, if they were just looking to connect, say, the left to the right, um, is that you're going to have to build the integrations to the banks, whether it's host to host, SWIFT, um, or eventually the API, as we'll talk about, the, the move to instant. Um, but that also comes at a cost and a time. Um, and then we have the formats as well. So each bank has a different format. Um, if you're looking to connect to one bank, you may have to create four or five formats for international payments, domestic, high value, low value. Um, and again, these can come at a huge cost um, and time to the business. Um, it could be six months plus for you just to create one format and test it. Um, so connectivity is key here to ensuring that move to digital um, goes seamlessly. Uh, controls, again, if we talk about the old manual way, most companies have grown um, either organically or through acquisition and will typically have through that journey disparate platforms um, and disparate legacy functions that, that don't really talk to each other. So having a standardized set of controls around the world um, will help you move into a digital world where um, you can seamlessly process payments. Um, and then finally, we have the optimization part. So how do we improve internal and external costs? So that might be bank fees, it might be um, payments on behalf of, uh, it may be the, the cost of processing manually, all these, these errors or duplicates, how do we optimize our transactions in that way? Um, so I'll just wanna go through, we spoke uh, at the start really about that day of the life of a manual way for treasury. So let's look at how that would relate now um, in this new, uh, digital way. So at 8 a.m. the treasurer comes into the office, they log into the application and all their balances are visible. So all of the manual tasks they carried out before disappear. At 8.30 balances, payments and transfers to banks all completed and the rest of the mornings then dedicated to control and compliance. Um, the afternoon then is implementing more value for the business. So we're looking there at business analysis negotiating with the banks. We've now got all this information at hand um, so we can start pushing the banks uh, to, to our benefit. Um, management and monitoring budgets, risk management, debt management, and participating in companies' financing policies. Um, so 
really all the most valuable task for treasurers to develop skills and concentrate on strategic projects. Now, this for me is, is the move really to instant. So for me, the future of payments is instant. Um, and that comes really in, in the components we need to consider, which are two areas for me, is one is real-time processing and one is real-time payments. Um, so I, I kind of see it as the before the event and after the event of a transaction. Um, so if we're looking at real-time processing, um, instant payments require APIs. Um, you can't send and receive in real time with file transfer technology. We need that data to flow out and in from banks and ERPs at real time. So AR APIs are the way to do that. Um, the, the challenges, again, for the business is no real difference to the start part where I mentioned around this connectivity and the formats. Um, even with API technology, you're going to have to go through and build this. So you'll need the expertise in-house from an API perspective. Um, you'll need to understand all the formats and how you're building and also the, the integrations with the banks um, and then understand what that cost implication is to you, um, what resources you'll need and how long it will actually take you to go to market. Um, so again, having a hub where you've got companies that are already doing this, um, Kareem, for example, that have the API connectivity uh, and are growing that, it takes away that burden from you um, and gives you a faster speed to market. Um, and obviously the benefits of real time are as they are real time balances, real time processing, real time responses. Um, you know, if the CFO comes out of a board meeting and says we need to make an acquisition today, you have real time availability and real time visibility over all your cash globally. Um, so you can then make faster decisions. Um, let's look at the after event part, which is the payment piece. Um, so there are around 60 uh, rails globally, um, just shy of with real time capability. Um, all of the major economies are now either developed or are developing instant payment schemes. Um, we've obviously got UK Faster Payments, SEPA Instant, um, Singapore, uh, the US, India, all have real-time capability. Um, globally, SWIFT with GPI and SWIFT Go and, and further developments there. Um, but we're also seeing um, interoperability between countries. So. P27 in the Nordics, for example, is a is a network for cross-border transactions for the Nordic region. Um, we're seeing Malaysia and Singapore link up um, to look at real-time remittances um, between country and Singapore and uh, India, for example, um, and the rise of central bank digital currencies. Um, so again, we're already seeing uh, projects within this space. Um, the Enbridge project is a cooperation between um, the BIS Innovation Hub, um, Hong Kong Center, Hong Kong Monetary, Bank of Thailand, and the Digital Bank of China and UAE. Um, so there's there's new uh, advances within the digital space that are moving forward um, to, to real time globally. Um, so how can an organization take advantage of the, the move to digital and then the move to, to faster? So, um, for me, as we mentioned, the controls and the connectivity, once you have that holistic view over all of your banks, your ERPs, and you put standard controls in place, um, you can then look to further optimize the payment process. But I do think it starts from there. You can't optimize anything without seeing um, you know, the processes together. Um, but Treasury then can become more strategic and efficient by using BI and data to understand all of their payment processes. You know, they, They'll find out, are we paying the same supplier in different ways across the business. Do we have high value payments and low value? Are we doing international wires and domestic payments to the same organization? How can we use then the, the, the digital world to, um, for example, in, in implement payments on behalf of? So we're just using that domestic account to make payments within that country. And we're using the instant network that's available there so that we can pay our suppliers instantly. Um, we can look then digitally for bank fee analysis. We can identify um, where all of our transactions are going, which banks we use for it, um, and then leverage that knowledge to um, to help support our, uh, our negotiating with the bank on fees. Um, we also have, for example, smart assignment. So again, once we know um, all of our banking landscape, where all of our payments are going, we can then look to route them in the, the most effective way. So setting up specific rules designed to, um, for example, any payment to the UAE in dirhams under a certain amount has to go through this bank. So we can set up rules to optimize our transactions. Um, 
And if we if, if the banks aren't able or our banking partners can't deliver um, for certain territories or, or countries from a domestic point or a real time uh, rail, there are fintechs uh, out there in the world that their go to market or their value proposition is actually that. So they have gone around the world to open up accounts in country um, to utilize the domestic rail, but also the, the, the faster payment infrastructure. Um, they become either regulated in that country if they have to, and they've gone through those requirements so that corporates don't need to. You can leverage off them. Um, and then let's take a look then at some of the use cases. Uh, so if we have a look at so B2B, so supplier payments, um, clearly there's, a, there's an angle for corporate uh, to be holding on to funds as long as possible um, to make as much, uh, for, for example, money on money markets to then pay instantly on the last day um, and ensure the transactions uh, credited at the other side. Um, we've got B2C, um, so insurance claims. Um, we've got contingent employee wages, uh, legal settlements, expenses, um, expat pensions being paid through local rails uh, cost effectively. Um, we've got the C2B, consumer to business, so bill pay or hospital payments, um, pay at POS. Uh, we've got domestic peer to peer, so uh, repayments to family and friends. Um, and then cross-border peer-to-peer uh, remittances uh, to family and friends. So with the move from manual to digital to real-time, we need to consider the, the big factor, which is real-time payment equals real-time fraud. Um, and at this point, I'm going to hand over to John um, to take you through that part. Thank you, Barry, for that wonderful insight into real-time payments. and. Uh, you know, uh, in the world of real-time payments, we do have the potential risk uh, uh, of uh, payments actually going awry, right? And that's where it's very important to understand uh, how fraud detection works and what does it mean in, in, in the post-pandemic world. Um, so just to bring um, some figures in front of you, um, you know, in terms of the organizations that are actual, uh, actually becoming uh, uh, the victims of such kind of online fraud, uh, you know, fraud because of uh, you know uh, internal uh, internal fraud actions coming up, coming in from the users within the AP team, for example, when it comes to vendor payments. Uh, but really looking at what is the uh, split by the type of organizations? So if you look uh, in, at the statistics, uh, you'll see that the majority of companies that we're looking at are from the private sector, uh, followed by uh, the government, uh, and you know also uh, you know few of these cases being distributed across non-governmental organizations or not-for-profit organizations. Um, you know, and it really tells us a story of the financial impact that these organizations have to you know bear uh, on account of payment frauds. Um, so what also we need to understand is. What are these uh, uh, reasons uh, uh, the due to which these uh, instances of fraud is happening? Uh, you know, first and foremost, we need to put a finger on the uh, internal controls that are that are there in place and across different organizations. So, if I really don't have the right sets of uh, you know policies that govern uh, payment processes, you are uh, susceptible to uh, you know payment risk. And you know that actually having having seen that, you'll also see that uh, you know there is uh, a lack of control when it comes to uh, you know payment approvals. Uh, what are the levels of approvals that are there across the organizations? You know whether do I uh, have two levels of approvals? You know for a treasury payment versus uh, you know I have you know four levels of approvals for a, a high value payment. Uh, you know so it, for for those organizations which have been smart. At adopting these controls, you would see that the number of instances would be lower. Um, and again, you know, a very important aspect is uh, the journey uh, of fraud detection starts from the top, right? So if there is a lack of oversight on the senior management, that uh, that is uh, that is a given that is given that there will be uh, potentially a risk uh, in terms of uh, payments coming, uh, you know, uh, across both treasury uh, as well as on the AP side, right? So it's very important to have management oversight. And then uh, if you look at certain other aspects on whether do you, uh, whether you have audit rails in place, do you have sufficient uh, controls in, in terms of managing uh, the exposures across different geographies, you know, the, the, the currency risk that come along with that, 
all of that contribute to uh, you know uh, the the fraud that is happening today right so let's go uh, slightly deeper into what is pertinent for treasury right um, so uh, obviously you know we are all looking at uh, the post pandemic uh, world now and a lot of these approvals are happening uh, remotely right so uh, i i need to start first looking at the very important aspect around bank connectivity um, so are my connections secure right can i have a possibility that may my network uh, could have been compromised right so uh, it's very important that all my connections to the bank are uh, fully secure uh, having connectivity using swift becomes the most logical option and even if there is a, a host to host connection and uh, it is very important to ensure that it is fully uh, secure highly encrypted you know so that there is no breach at the connectivity uh, aspect as, as well um, in terms of uh, you know the actual processes around my bank mandates you know i need to look at who are my signatories do i have all the information in place do i have the kyc in place you know and if there is a possibility of any changes you know do i have uh, controls in place you know do i use effective measures including 4i principle for every action that needs to be done you know uh, to ensure that no changes are done on the uh, the account signatories on every account that is associated with the payments um, again uh, when it comes to the core aspect around vendor payments it's very essential that we uh, you know monitor what is the information that comes from the erp uh, my vendor master becomes very important because any changes to the vendor master uh, means that the supplier information would be compromised right and the most important aspect around that is uh, the bank account itself right so how do i ensure that uh, my uh, my my system is secure and i do not allow any changes uh, to the supplier information uh, and that's again uh, a very important aspect around preventing payment frauds especially around uh, you know the internal fraud that can possibly happen if uh, an employee you know uh, you know decides to actually change the bank account and replace that account uh, of that supplier with a personal account then that's a possibility that's happening uh, and and believe me you hear of these cases every day right so what are we doing uh, to ensure that these cases uh, are actually not happening and and how do i put in place effective controls now from an it perspective it's very uh, basic but yes it needs to be mentioned uh, how many layers of protection do i have on the uh, user access do i have you know uh, you know two factor authentication do i have you know enough controls for data segregation and have a strong password policy so that any unauthorized access is not allowed right and then coming back to the centralization of payments uh, again real time payments means you know obviously all these payments that are happening in a blink of a uh, you know uh, i would need to have that visibility across different levels especially around in the levels of approvals that we see we need to have all the uh, authorized users as well as users with, within the internal fraud unit uh, within the organization which has now become a new aspect around uh, payments right you know earlier we never used to have a dedicated unit around frauds but now increasingly organizations are having an internal fraud unit to monitor any potentially uh, fraudulent payment suspicious payments there is aml compliance that is coming in a big way so it becomes very important to have these controls in place right so and then when it comes to consistency um, you know i need to have uh, consistency of the policy being applied for every bank at e every account that is associated with the payment for different jurisdictions right i i may operate in north america i may operate in uk i may operate in emerging uh markets today right uh, so that means i need to plan and plan effectively to ensure that all these controls are effectively uh, rolled out uh, to the different regions that i operate in right and then coming to the technology aspect around how does this enable uh, you know um, you know the 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 screening effectively so the screening actually begins with the ability to ensure that the information of the beneficiary is correct and then do i actually screen any of these beneficiaries against some kind of a list which anyway the banks have been using for a very long time right we know the uh, factiva the world checks of the world which actually screen payments in effectively right but what if i am actually having this kind of a capability within my payment solution right that's what today we need and uh, effective fraud detection is also 
incorporating the the benefits of uh, screening as well right so screening against list becomes an important tool and then you know having that centralization means having this as a dashboard right so this dashboard gives me all this information that i need right so let's now have a look at what are the three pillars that we need to focus on right in order to have an uh, effective defense against payment fraud uh, clearly i mean you know i'm just uh, making a summary of the uh, the processes and the technology that goes along and and what could be the possible benefits that we're looking at right so in 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 terms of the process i mean we talked a lot about how customers actually uh, you know uh, are and the corporates mainly today are important you know paying a lot of importance to uh, ensuring that the information that they have the data that they have in, is accurate there is integrity to that data uh, and that is the first step before you even start thinking of screening them and this needs to be a policy that needs to be adopted uh, at the at the global level whether i am actually screening third parties whether i am screening uh, beneficiaries across different geographies having that uh, screening process is the first step in order to ensure that and i screen all my uh, payments at the uh, at the in, in, at the initial level as well as towards the level when it uh, actually needs to be uh, you know generated as a payment file right and uh, when it comes to the policy i can have uh, multiple policies around what kind of payments do i need to uh, you know execute when it comes to my my vendors how many times can i execute the payment do i have a payment count in place do i actually check for potential uh, you know uh, fraudulent payment scenarios when i say scenarios i can actually look at you know possibilities right uh, if uh, i talked about uh, you know bank account being replaced there could also be possibility that the very first time i make a payment to a supplier i could have that possibility that the account uh, that i make the payment into uh, was was not the correct account and it, the 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 fraud actually was perpetrated even at source right the, even before the payment actually came in it it seems it, it needs to be uh, screened uh, at at the very basic level so the technology here means three things uh, real time payment means the have, having that ability to ensure that uh, you have the apis in place so that means ease of integration we talked about authentication multi factor authentication plays a critical role here uh, in in terms of ensuring that the right person is accessing the right information and executing the payment you know uh, in in accordance with your bank mandates right and also emerging technologies very importantly machine learning can i use that yes the answer is we have the benefit of historical information we are in a position where machine learning actually allows some of these uh, screenings to be done uh, automatically based on the patterns that have been detected by the system right the machine is learning and that's where you know uh, some of these benefits are very very tangible right um, just quickly wrapping up on what we are actually seeing here when you look you, when you are looking at technology you are actually seeing a very focused screening approach you are looking at re reducing the false positive sometimes where you may not want to have them uh we talked about mfa reducing any of possibility of the account being compromised because of the uh, checks and balances that are there in place and then you know having these emerging technologies like machine learning allowing you to have the capability to detect payment anomalies right so uh, this is just you know few of the tangible benefits that we talk about but from a fraud prevention obviously some of these processes adoption of technology will lead to a lot of reduction in the fraud that uh, corporates face right so uh, i think uh, if there are no questions uh, barry i think uh, i would like to thank uh, uh, the audience um, you know who have actually uh, listened to us patiently and uh, and also act uh, you know for having this forum uh, to you know uh, discuss about real time payments and the fraud detection capabilities right so uh daniel uh, if you would like to come in here if there is any uh, other uh, questions that may have come up i we would be happy to answer barry uh yeah just thank you uh, all to uh, everyone that's taken the time out of their day to uh, to hear our talk i hope you found it informative um if there are any questions uh, please let us know um, and if you would like to know anything after then um we're both available to reach out to